Welcome to the last episode of Fundamentals of Chest Radiography. This is lesson number nine. Today we are going to talk about medical devices that might appear on the chest x-ray. My name is Dr. Andras Seke and I have prepared this video for you with the help of my colleague, Dr. Hedvig Todt. Hedvig, if you're listening, I dedicate this video to you. Let's begin with endotracheal tubes. ETTs are large bore tubes with a radio opaque marker and no side holes. Their tip is usually diagonally shaped and there is a balloon at the end which can be inflated to prevent aspiration of gastric material. The tip of the ETT should lie about 3 to 5 centimeters from the carina, which is about half the distance from the carina to the medial ends of the clavicles. There is a saying hose goes where the nose goes, meaning that extension of the neck elevates, flexion of the neck lowers the tube in the trachea. It is most frequently misplaced into the right main bronchus, the bronchus intermedius, and the esophagus. Here is this young lady who was intubated in an ambulance car, and upon arrival to the hospital we saw this image, and you might see that the tip of this endotracheal tube is far below the carina. It is actually in the bronchus intermedius, which is uh, this brown area over here, so just beyond the point where the right upper low bronchus originates. Therefore, there is complete atelectasis of the right upper lobe and the whole left lung. Here's another complication. You can see that the tip of this ETT is too high. And the reason for that is because the balloon was inflated too soon and the ETT got stuck in the neck area. This, of course, might damage the vocal cords, so this ETT needs to be repositioned. The smaller siblings of ETTs are the tracheostomy tubes, which come in two sizes, a longer one and a shorter one. They are used in respiratory failure when the patients need, need a long-term intubation. The tip should be halfway between the point of insertion and the carina, and the stoma is usually inserted in the third thoracic vertebral body. Here's a tracheostomy tube, which uh, was uh, inserted. However, the tip got broken off and is now wedged in the left main bronchus. I took this image out of this journal article. Central venous catheters are quite common. They are used for the administration of hyperosmolar agents, which are not suitable for peripheral administration. And uh, they are either inserted through the subclavian or jugular veins. So this would be the subclavian on the left, subclavian on the right, and the two jugular veins. And from, let's suppose that the patient has a central venous catheter inserted from the left, so it should come over here below the cl clavicle, cross over the midline, and then turn down towards the heart, and the tip should, should lie about here at the junction of the superior vena cava and the right atrium. A serious complication of a venous catheter insertion is a pneumothorax, so every time a patient gets a catheter inserted through a vein, then a chest CT is obtained to rule out a pneumothorax. Here are some complications of a CVC insertion. A pneumothorax, I have talked about before, you can see that the catheter comes from the left, crosses over to the right, and the tip is at its expected position. However, there's a large pneumothorax. This CVC was inserted through the right jugular vein. The tip is at the correct position. However, there is this large oval opacity, which is a hematoma. And you can see that this catheter was inserted into the left subclavian vein. It crosses over to the right-hand side. 
However, instead of turning towards the heart, it crosses and goes into the right subclavian vein. Quinton catheters are very similar to CVCs, but they have two lumens and their tips are some distance apart. They are used for administration of medication and for drawing blood at the same time. Schwanguns catheters, we have talked about them previously. They are used to differentiate a cardiac from a non-cardiac pulmonary edema. They look very similar to CVCs. However, they are pushed into the right atrium, the right ventricle, into the pulmonary trunk, and uh, into either the right or the left pulmonary artery, and then into a smaller capillary. And uh, as a rule of thumb, they should lie no more than two centimeter from the hilum. And uh, if they're pushed out too far, then we can cause an infarction. And uh, on this image, you can see what the ICU doctors see when they insert this catheter. Um, they actually go by watching the monitor and uh, and uh, looking at these uh, at these measurements. And uh, since they have these these uh, measurements uh, memorized, they know when they reach the ventricle, the pulmonary artery and finally the small capillary. Here are some complications of a Schwanguns catheter. If, uh, if it's pushed out too far, as I said, uh, farther than uh, two centimeter away from the hilum, that's not good because uh, if it's pushed out too far, then we can easily cause a pulmonary infarct, which appears as an inhomogeneous opacity around the tip of the catheter. Chest tubes. They are either used for removing air, in which case the tip is angled towards the apex, or they are used to drain fluid from the pleural space. In the latter, the tip is angled towards the basal segments. They have a radio opaque marker and they have some side holes some of which are visible, the others are not that easy to see, and uh, all of these holes should lie within the pleural space. You should report where the tip is located, and, and if all the holes are in the chest cavity or not. They're usually inserted between ribs four and five, and this is how they, sh they look in real life. And now we have arrived to the second part of this topic, of, of this talk, pacemakers. Pacemakers control the heart with electrical impulses if the heartbeat is either too slow or if the heart's electrical pathways are blocked. Other functions include cardioversion or rhythm change. And these pacemakers usually consist of a pulse generator and uh, some leads that you can see over here. This is a two lead uh, pacemaker. So here one tip is in the atrium and one lead is in the right ventricle. These leads should have no sharp kinks, only gentle curves and of course no breaks in them. But we'll see examples of these complications very soon. Here is a single chamber pacemaker. Uh, this electrode is inserted into the right atrium because the sinus node is not functioning properly. And on the lateral image, you can see that the tip is angled anteriorly and superiorly because the little ear, the auricula of the atrium, is um, in a ventral position in relation to the atrium. And this is where the tip of this uh, lead should uh, go single chamber pacemaker, but the tip is now in the right ventricle. You can see that uh, this is the expected position of the apex of the right ventricle. And you can see that the, that the lead looks very similar on the, on the lateral image. However, it's, uh, 
it's uh, pointing anterior and uh, its position is uh, more horizontal than what we saw before. Now let's uh, combine the two and get a dual chamber pacemaker in which we have a, a tip in the right atrium and one in the right ventricle and here you can see the different appearance of the two different uh, leads and their tips. Sometimes the second lead is not in the ventricle but it's in the right ventricle outflow tract. So this is uh, what we are now accustomed to. The tip is in the right atrium. It's angled anterior and superior. However, the second lead, the tip of the second lead is, is over here, a little, little bit to the left of the vertebral bodies, and it's also angled anterior and superior, and that is the lead in the right ventricle outflow tract. It's so rare that if you see this, you should immediately consult the cardiologist just to make sure that what you're thinking of is what actually is happening to your patient. Biventricular pacemakers are also known as cardiac resynchronization therapy devices. There is um, one electrode in the right ventricle and one in the left ventricle. However, there is no opening between the ventricles like a septal defect. What happens is that the the lead that goes into the left ventricle goes through the coronary sinus and then uh, it, it'll reach the, coron the cardiac vein which touches the wall of the left ventricle and that ha that's how the conduction takes place. And of course there might be a third lead which will be in the right atrium. There are wireless pacemakers in 2020. We can expect that. They're quite small and they are self-contained right ventricular single chamber pacemakers which are implanted percutaneously via a femoral approach. And only two companies make these and this is how they appear on the chest x-ray. It's quite rare, but if you see this, then you will recognize it. Um, IDCs or defibrillators. Um, so these ICDs can defibrillate the heart with high energy if they sense tachycardia or fibrillation. There is um, one electrode, as you can see it here, but it has two shock coils. One is at the junction of the brachiocephalic vein and the superior vena cava which is indicated by this green arrow over here. And the second one is in the right ventricle. There are combinations of ICDs and pacemakers. And um, then you have three electrodes, two pacemaker electrodes, one in the right atrium and one in the left ventricle. And the third one is a combined pacemaker ICD electrode in the right ventricle. Here are some complications of pacemakers. This, this is the so-called twiddler syndrome. So what happens is that when patients play with the pulse generator and uh, rotate the generator, then the wires may retract from their normal position. So you can see that instead of um, seeing the tip of this uh, pacemaker in the, in the ventricle, you see that it's very, very close now to the pulse generator. So it's no surprise that it's not functioning properly. And sometimes the wires may break. You can see that there is a transparent perpendicular line over this uh, wire. And I don't have an image of that, but sometimes the insulation of the wire is uh, broken and uh, that you should also report on. Nasogastric tubes are used for feeding and administration of medication. They have a radio opaque marker that breaks at holes and uh, 
Remember that the gastroesophageal junction is where the left hemidiaphragm touches the vertebral bodies. So it's about here. And so the tip of the nasogastric tu tube should lie 10 centimeter away from that point. So here, the end of this tube is not far enough. And um, on the next slide, we'll see some complication of uh, the nasogastric tube. So here, the tube was inserted into the trachea and then the tip is now down in the right lower lobe and they initialized feeding and so this inhomogeneous opacity is uh, actually chemical pneumonia and then uh, over here you can see that the tube is again in the trachea in this case it went into the left main bronchus curved back went into the right main bronchus so the tip is now probably at the level of the bronchus intermedius feeding tubes are very similar to what you saw before but they are longer uh, because um, their tip should be postpilaric so it's in the duodenum as you can see it over here but they're also used for nutrition and that's it you have completed fundamentals of chest radiography i will have some bonus material on atelectasis and classic signs in chest radiography so stay tuned